This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 385, recorded on January 3rd, 2019. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the Average Guy TV studios here in beautiful Bellevue, Nebraska. Some great weather on the horizon here, even though it's the middle of winter. You can't uh, you can't blame 40s and 50s. It's going to be pretty nice this weekend. Of course, we post the show, and you're going to for this show, you're going to want to head out to the show notes. I mean, you want to do that for every show, but. TheAverageGuy.tv slash HGG385. You're going to, uh, Paul will have some links out there and you're going to want to jump out there and go to those links. Paul probably does some of the best blogging on the planet. So you want to get that. That's found all at TheAverageGuy.tv. Don't forget, you can join us live on our mobile app as well. Easiest way to listen live and on the road. I think I've got that all fixed now. We're using the Spreaker uh, desktop app to get that done. Actually, changing over to that app, the sound got a lot better and it's just a lot easier to stream that way. Head over to HomeGadgetGeeks.com, whether it's an iPhone or Android, and just get that on your device so you have it. If you're on the road on a Thursday night and you want to listen, or if you're in some place where you know, bandwidth is an issue, we will stream that really, really, really efficiently to you. So it's just one way of doing it. You don't have to do it all the time. You probably have a podcast player, an app, or you watch the video or whatever you do on YouTube. But it's just another thing to have in your arsenal, Home Gadget Geeks. Dot com. Mike Weger out tonight. I got a note from him yesterday and he said, Hey, would you mind if I it didn't show up? It's my anniversary. I'm like, dude, like you will not come podcast on your anniversary. That's just not going to happen. I don't want you to do that. I did see some proof he had taken Hannah out for dinner. So Mike, we'll miss you tonight, but uh, um, a good thing you didn't have to be there. I alluded to him earlier. Paul Brayer is back. We get Paul on uh, kind of once a year or so to kind of catch up with What's going on in his world? Tinkertry.com is his site. I think I think the best blog on the internet. Paul, welcome to Home Gadget Geeks. Thank you, Jim. It's always an honor to be back here with you. It's just fun to catch up. It's been uh, many years now. Maybe five years ago when I first appeared. So yeah. it's awesome. It's, uh, a little, it's a little scary. We've been doing it that long. That's kind yeah, of uh, we did a Google Hangout from an airplane. Remember that? Uh, we did. <laughs> 2013, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. We've done a lot of crazy stuff over the years. Of course, you were home server show listener as well. We've met several times at home server show meetups, reset meetups, whatever we call those things. Uh, always good to meet you in person. Uh, we haven't had a meetup in a while. The guys have been uh, dogging me to get a meetup going on in Omaha. So I don't know. I was on the hook last fall. I didn't get it done. Uh, maybe we'll try again this summer or this fall. But always good to have you on, Paul. You always bring uh, you always bring it. And I'm always super impressed when I go out to your blog. This is the point. I don't I don't normally do this on a show, but if you're listening somewhere you can get to a computer, you you just want to stop, hit hit pause, I will wait for you. And then you want to go to tinkertry.com. Like Paul does some really great stuff with his blogging. It's just not a blog or clickbait or you know the stuff you'd expect. He goes out there and it's like a detailed post on everything. And then if he has updates, he spends a bunch of time updating it. He goes back in there and leaves uh, stats and pictures. Uh, you're one of the most, Paul, you're one of the most careful, thorough, consistent, accurate guys that I know. I know your site does very, very well. It's not just gadgets, though. Uh, uh, Paul is, for some folks, maybe listening to you for the first time. Tell us a little bit about your day job now. What do you What do? You do? Yeah, I'm coming up on... Uh... Two years at VMware on January 8th, it'll be two year anniversary. Uh, as a vSAN systems engineer, I talk to customers about, <laughs> you could call it dry pooling, remember Windows Home Server? It's 10 years later, right? It's dry pooling for the enterprise. So VMware has a huge uh, audience in the enterprise, 500,000 customers, right? Uh, a whole lot of them have a lot of drives and nowadays with a, what's called a hyperconverged solution where you just tie together a bunch of servers with 10 gig networking. Yeah, it's basically high speed dry pooling. So vSAN, is a, a data store, a place to put your VMs and run them with a great speed and a whole lot less money than it used to cost for like fiber channel stuff that, you know, people don't tend to have fiber channel at home anyway, right? So the enterprise stuff is looking more and more like home lab stuff. So it's been a, a really good uh, wild ride for the last two years uh, at VMware, growing rapidly, hiring like crazy, changing managers, it's been all good and traveling a bit too. Yeah, we're going to talk about that um, here in a little bit. Last week in the post-show crypto, 
I told folks we were going to talk about some things other than crypto. Funny that you mentioned drive pooling. We, I'm still a stable bit drive pool user from those home server show days. It's actually, I'm using it now on my miners to make sure drives. We've been doing some burst mining and that's all hard drive based. And I have a bunch of hard drives that I've put together in my server days, in my storage days. I never had this much data, you know, I've never had this many drives, even when we were doing it. Today, I'm at 68 terabytes here at the house. Oh, <laughs> it's stupid. Like, it's <laughs> stupid. But we, uh, you got to keep track of all those drives, and uh, StableBit uh, does that for me. I imagine for the home user, there may be a VMware solution that would do that for me as well. Let me know if one of the drives drops out of the pool. Is that true? Well, let's see. So when I talk about vSAN, yeah, enterprise solution where you have a bunch of drives, caching layer and capacity drives. You put the two together. Sure. Home lab stuff, it's probably a different world. More typically, people would have NASes or just a RAID controller tying everything together with the RAID array, right? So vSAN is like a software RAID array instead of a hardware RAID controller that you stick in a server for $800, like a quality RAID controller that can keep up with today's, uh, kind of keep up with today's SSDs. Moving forward, things are just going with NVMe. Uh, UDF2 form factor on the PCIe bus, five or six times faster than any SATA drive you ever had. SATA and SAS, they were meant for spinning rust from you know, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, things are moving forward, whether it's burst mining or whatever. Your cost per gigabyte is now down to, it's not double anymore to get some low end NVMe drives. So you get four or five times faster than a SATA bus drive going with NVMe. So as you know, I, I've mentioned NVMe a few hundred times in my almost, I'm coming up in a thousand posts in the last seven years. It's been a game changer the last three years. Like it's been a big deal. And then Optane is the other big news in the last uh, year or so as well. Um, so yeah, I'm into that stuff. That was a long rambling answer. No, it's answer a good before. answer. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a, well, if I were going to replicate, say I have, I have 60 terabytes here in my network and yeah, I understand. wanted to replicate that using solid state or NVMe, well, is that, is that realistic to, to replace it with the 60 terabytes? <laughs> with SSD, let's see, you'd be looking at probably micron high density, but a little lower performing 11 terabyte SSDs to try to bring the price down. We need a whole lot of them and a RAID controller to get decent speed. So honestly, you're still looking at spinning rust 10 terabyte drives that are under 300 now, right? That's really where you're at for those kind of numbers you're yeah. talking. It's I, really, I bought, them, I bought the eight big numbers back in the day, the eight terabyte Seagates and Western Digital, just external that were running USB. Good enough for burst. You know, certainly yep. from a from a storage capacity standpoint, that's a little trickier if I'm trying to stripe data across those USB drives. But burst is kind of built to it doesn't necessarily need all the storage in one place. And it's okay that it's dispersed around the network. So not as worried about it. Cost performance is good. We have been, Schoonover has been keeping track of SSD tri, SSD prices in our Facebook group. And man, you are right. I mean, I cannot believe just the absolute falling prices when we yep. think of, uh, of of traditional SSD. A one terabyte just a year ago was nearly out of reach. And today you start thinking about, you see those prices and you kind of go, hmm. You know, maybe I'll just go one terabyte SSD. Yep. And um, go, going back to that word, you know, vSAN in my day job, QDEPTH is where, where what it's the huge game changer. So NVMe is basically like a RAID controller, a single device on a gum stick or a U.2 form factor or a 2.5 inch enclosure, uh, which is 2.5 inch, but thicker, right? Um, actually, I have one up here. So here's your traditional, you know, Micron SATA we're used to, right? Um, a PCIe card would be... One of these. Let's take out the little uh, stash here. Uh, so, so if you're listening, uh, as Paul's doing this, if you're listening audio only, yeah. this may be the time you go to the YouTube video or download our video or SS feed because Paul's showing some stuff. But keep going, Paul. Yeah, I'll try to keep it auditory too. But basically, I'm showing that NVMe comes in many form factors. There's Gumstick, which most of you have probably seen by now that fits in your laptop or a small compact server. Uh, or there's PCIe, um, a, a half height, half length card called the Intel Optane uh, SSD. Nine or there's M.2, uh, sorry, U.2 form factor, a hot swap, but little taller drive. Let me see if I can look for that. Oh, we got a headset that's cordless. Here we go. I've got it right here. So, um, yeah, what I'm holding is something that looks like a laptop drive, only about twice as thick with heat sinks, uh, you know, aluminum um, heat sink on the bottom. So, those are different form factors, but it doesn't matter. All three of the same speed, they're all in the PCIe bus. So, yeah, that's changing everything, both servers and home labs. Home labs first, actually. I've been blogging about this stuff for almost three years now, ZND and getting uh, NVMe in your home lab. 
And now the enterprise is catching up finally. Uh, they just charge more, right? <laughs> a lot more. Kevin Schoonover said NVMe is great, but server CPUs are running out of PCIe lanes. Um, with, uh, with, uh, yep. Yeah, more, more and more using PCIe for almost everything now. Paul, do you have a ruler SSD? No. I don't know what that means. Yeah, that's Intel. Uh, if you go to tinkertry.com forward slash ruler, you can read all about it, including all the form factors I just rattled off. I do not have one in hand. I've gotten to see them at uh, uh, the last two VMworlds at the end of August. Um, it's Intel's push at a different form factor that dissipates heat better. Um, there's a lot of heat on a nine watt device in this enclosure. And if you go with the ruler, you can get a lot more storage. So they're trying to fit a petabyte in a one U pizza box server. That's the goal with ruler. And Samsung's doing something similar. Um, Different standards, different form factors, but it's all envy me. Yeah. Yep. For for the average guy today, if they're replacing an SSD drive or they're going to replace a spinner, one terabyte SSD, is that the is that the way to go right now? Do you think? Sure, if it's just SATA, but if they have an M.2 gum stick here, I'm going to take the camera off and show you. Um, and Jim, this is the uh, world premiere for your audience of my new Ooh. basement lab that took me uh, about a yep. year to build, thanks to some help from my kids. Um, kind of renovating the area of the basement, setting it aside. So. Ta -da, now we got nice. the uh, big logo on the top. It's a eight foot workbench and by four feet deep. So I can actually fit lots of stuff. So here we have the dual screens that I'm sitting at, right? Most of the time it's me working alone, not so much podcasting down here. And here's a bunch of stuff, including of course, got a UPS battery going there. And we've got a server here and there it is. Oh, that seemed too well with the C920 modest webcam. It's no, not too bad, it's but working out all right. But here's something out on the table here. So to bring what I'm saying to life and trying to explain it, the visuals here to an audio audience, I'm looking at a motherboard that's lying here on my workbench on an anti-static mat. And it's middle of winter, that's kind of important. And you've got an M.2 gum stick on there. So yes, if your server has an M.2 slot, if it's made in the last two, three years, or even a Core i7, not really a server, but a home workstation motherboard. Yeah, use that, put your money in that. <laughs> you can be a whole lot happier running VMs or running um, you know, Windows or, or Linux, whatever, it's going to multitask and run a whole lot more workload, a lot, a lot better. I'm so into NVMe here, I've got nine of them on one system. So there's four on this card and four. This PCIe card is only like $80. It's just passing through each M.2 at full speed to the motherboard. Nice. So it, this has enough lanes to do it. And the price of this is modest. Um, so, you know, like the, I don't know, let's see, everything you're looking at here is probably a little over two grand. This is actually only a four core, uh, ZND 2100, it's called. How big so, yeah, are those they, NVMe drives again that you have in there? How big are they? Oh, these are pretty tiny. I'm just experimenting with uh, vSAN in a pastor mode. So let's see, these are old Samsungs where I could afford it. They were under $100 each, PM 951s, I believe, OEM. And these are Optane, but they're only 32 gig inside in the front. So that'd be my caching layer and that's my capacity layer. That's eight drives and two PCI slots running at full speed. That is awesome, right? That lets you do on a system like this, you can jam a lot of uh, NVMe in there, five of them on the side with the PCI slot, and you have four empty bays for hot swap and two more bays on the side. So uh, you may remember at the home server show meetup out in Indianapolis, I, I brought this, uh, you know, two years ago. Um, so yeah, it's been a, uh, there's a quick look at what's new in the lab. And then I've got everything, you know, close at hand when I'm trying to demo or show something here. Let me bring up my preview screen so I can see what my camera's aiming at a little better. Did you, who did you um, have paint that up there? Did what, or is that a sticker or what did what did you do to get your logo? Up? Yeah, FedEx can print that for only under like fifty bucks, and the thing is eight feet long. Nice. So that's just a scalable vector graphic version of my you know Love it. website logo and printed that. A bunch of boxes where you can kind of see what I'm working on and GPUs and Optane and all close at hand, and then finally, you know, place to to work and get the two screens. Now I still have my primary office upstairs with a closed door where I'm, you know, make a living doing my day job. This is where I come to tinker and, and you know, use my fix a kit to try all kinds of stuff on my on my workbench, including projects like that, kind of skunk works. Oh, what's up There's with the travel asteroid. router? What's up oh. with the asteroid server over there? Is that, uh, you have some, you have some. Uh... Sure, we're gonna talk about that. And let me bring up the travel router. We'll talk about it in a minute too. Yeah. Uh, this is 199 on, you know, Walmart. I tried it in the store like two months ago. And then watch for prices, and what do you know? It went on sale for one ninety nine. Really? Took all, took about an hour to assemble. A little uh, eight dollar IKEA stand underneath to bring it up to full height because I'm a six foot one dude. Yeah. So it's kind of you know like uh, I don't know uh, two thirds scale, right? 
but it's pretty cool. 17 inch screen, so they don't scrimp there. So yeah, you could call it a meme arcade emulator. You could replace buttons. You can do stuff. Yeah. But right out of the box, 200 bucks, pretty impressive. That and, is. That's not bad. Um, yeah, and a little fun. Yeah. All right, let's go back to the tripod here. We uh, while you're while you're setting that back up, I next week, uh, you know, you talk about retro games. We, I am working on. If you look on the video right up here, I have the original Xbox there. I've been messing around with that for last week or two. One of my Christmas projects ordered a 350 gigabyte uh, IDE drive because those are ID in there. They come eight with an eight gig standard. We're going to replace that out and then load that with emulators and games. And I don't know how much Paul will actually play it, but I just want to do it. Like it's one of those things I'm like, well, I got some time. We'll, we'll pull that off and uh, I'll soft mod. I do have to take the screws out of the box to to uh, to get to the drives and replace them, but it's kind of a little retro gaming. So I'm I'm hoping to throw some some emulators on there and play some of those. We were at the SAC Museum here in Nebraska, here in Omaha, and they actually had a whole um, room dedicated to the video game and video game industry. And you could go and see. I can't believe I didn't take more pictures. That was really stupid. But they had Centipede, and they had uh, they had an asteroid. They had original Asteroids game there as well. And it was pretty cool. I played those, and uh, it was it was a ton of fun. And so I think we're going to do some, the goal is down here on the floor, the Xbox came in today and we've been talking about that on the show as well. Um, I haven't set it up yet, but uh, we'll be going Xbox and some old school Xbox. Coming up. Mike and I'll be talking about that next week on the show. You guys will have to come back and listen to it. So um, you said you're in the, the, the area that you have there, the desk area that took a, took about a year to put together and you got the kids involved. Jim, I've been blogging for seven years. For five, about four years, once the kids went off to college, I took over the ping pong table. <laughs> so almost all my posts were a giant sheet of paper, like you saw the paper roll up in the top. That's my backdrop. You see this green backdrop behind me. Let me aim the camera a little bit over. The green backdrop, I can put different colors back there. It's just paper from B&H photo video in New York. That was on a ping pong table, trying to look a little more professional. Almost all my photos for years were on that table. It's really nice to give that back to the family, have a recreation area over here in the basement. And finally, this area is, you know, basically my room at this point, which is awesome. And I got some storage cabinets and organized shelves and even a um, quick little print shop here. That purple thing. Let's see if you can see that on camera. Oh, yeah, that's kind of uh... that way in the background. That lets me the super servers that uh, go out from floor. Let's see. What are you seeing on camera? Get this bigger. Here we go. People get a USB drive to put their ESXi in. They get pre-printed stickers that are like carefully cut with a fancy exacto blade that's what the purple machine is it's a exacto blade cutter to make these backplate labels because for small scale you know a few hundred you're not going to get anyone to print you know metal backplates for you custom like this so i just made them uh, with nice. my son's help it's a lot of fun so yeah that's that's a little uh project and that's what the print shop is it's also well as a bunch of a bunch of storage and cables and all back love there. it love it trying it's to get some... organized jim yeah it's like a business you got going on there uh, well, I did turn it into an LLC in 2013 to try to keep the, you know, advertiser uh, revenue and tax forms and all that, you know, doing it the way you should do it. And that's been good for me to learn all that, too. Power along the, I'm, I'm noticing power plugs along the top. I, I, I assume some adjustable lighting in there so you can kind of, you, you mentioned you get different colors or just different backgrounds in your lighting. And is it any yeah. automated? And have you automated any of it? No, it's just a big sheet of paper I could, uh, you know, pull down as needed or change the color. Um, it's been interesting. Like uh, I've got overhead LED panels in the basement that I replaced all the uh, fluorescent tubes that were starting to go after 24 years in the house. Yeah, that was fun to rip all those out. This tr trofer, trofer, however you say it, tearing them all out was awesome. They're five inches deep. They have four fluorescent tubes each going to 150 electricity and twice the lumens. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's challenges. They can flicker. Cheaper brands can flicker. And then when you're doing an iPhone 10, uh, let's see, uh, you can get flicker if your camera interacts and the brightness varies too much on cheap LED. So it's not easy moving to LED everywhere. But yes, I have a large amount of light above me trying to get depth of field when I'm doing photography on the bench too. Um, so you also, uh, when I, in the tour, I mentioned this travel router, right? And that's one yeah. of the topics you were going to ask me about. So. Yeah. Uh, you and I did a podcast from me sitting in Germany doing a hotel about Vivals, another uh, software-defined storage thing I was working on. So in 2014, I was doing an IBM Redbook back then. And 
we did a podcast from my room. I remember that well. And since VPNing to home and had some issues with, you know, Google redirecting to the German version of the website, all that stuff, right? Now it's four years later, I got to go to Prague, Czechoslovakia, and this time bring my wife along, which was awesome. We drove 1400 miles all over Europe. And um, we ended up finding it way cheaper flight to Berlin. So we drove saving, you know, $600 per, uh, per her airfare and, and mine, me there on business for part of the trip. And instead of flying to Prague, which was, you know, twice as much. So it was awesome. Uh, Aer Lingus flies from our local airport in Hartford. That was a game changer getting to Ireland in an hour and 15 minutes with a tailwind that blew us along at 780 miles an hour over the Atlantic in a cheap airplane, right? That's a game changer. That's faster than me getting to San Francisco. Yeah. So, wow, going from a local airport and, and just getting to Europe that fast. Just awesome. After four years, that's now what's happening with small planes, two engines, more and more airlines getting in that overseas business for way, you know, good affordable pricing. And I brought some stuff along like this. I was configuring this on that five hour plane ride because I didn't have time before the trip. And what it did was let me go to four or five different hotels in Europe as we drove around where, you know, the, you know, the captive portal that grabs you. How about I just clone the MAC address on my laptop, configure this for all for once for each hotel room, and then all the devices just join and share the hotel Wi-Fi connection, right? So this lets you do that. There's many devices, but GL iNet is one of the more popular ones, pre-configured with a pretty you know fancy firmware on there. What's the that, retail on that? That was one? ooh, gosh, I don't remember. Gotta look it up. Remember, and what's the name of it again? So let me bring up the article, uh, tickettrader.com forward slash travel dash tech dash 2018. And I'm bringing that up now. GLINet. And I'll put that in the show notes, of course, Jim. I should have known it would be in an article somewhere. Yeah, I'll get the price for you in just a second. GL-INet is currently on Amazon. Go into my shopping link here. $69. No, it's not bad. Yep. Little antennas, good range. I had no issues with it. Um, you can do wired connection with Ethernet. You can repeat a Wi-Fi, all sorts of flexibility there. So that was one thing in the travel tech article. Did, There's a few did others. You, did you yeah, VPN at all when you were over there? Did you run everything through a VPN or did you just go straight straight through? Uh, I did. I got another article for, uh, where I allude to how do I securely get back to my home lab when I'm away for um, 10 days going over uh, Germany into Czech Republic and into Poland. And that's Duo authentication for Windows login and RDP. That's a mouthful. What is that? Cisco bought a company called Duo. When I go to a remote desktop to my home lab for when I'm in Europe or whatever, it's not, let's see, the it, connection's encrypted, but really you're like knocking on the door of your home lab where you have port forwarding set for port 433, which gets through any hotel or whatever. If you try to do fancy port 3389 or you're in a corporate network, you're not gonna get to your RDP that way. They get often blocked out on different networks. So you have to you know, port forward port 443 to one machine or one virtual machine leave running in your home. That's not very secure. Anyone in the world could try to brute force hack its username and password. So, Duo lets you, if your phone is locked in in your pocket, you double click an RDP icon in your desk and 4,000 miles away in my case, it opens up username and password and it then challenges you with a dual factor on your watch, if you have a watch, uh, like an Apple watch, or if your phone is unlocked and it'll pop you up on your phone and say, do you accept or deny? So it's basically roll your own dual factor for secure connection to your home. Then once I'm at home, my internet's extremely fast. You just got to paint the bits over RDP. None of that sluggish hotel stuff. So I've dealt with some pretty crappy years, uh, uh, Wi-Fi over the 15 some odd years of a lot of hotel travel. And the way I get around it is just forget the hotel Wi-Fi, just get the bare minimum connection to get to home. And then once I'm at home, do all my surfing on that remote machine. That, that's how I do it. Um, so I don't, and I already, once in a while I used a VPN too in some situations on my travels. Um, but yeah, in that same travel article, I cover this duo authentication. It's free, which is awesome. Cisco bought them like a year ago, so let's hope it stays free. We'll see. Yeah, you never know. You never know. It, yep. It's um, I know a lot of the guys that listen are will VPN everywhere, and uh, so it always it always comes up um, as a question in what we're in, in what we're doing. What'd you find um, w when you got overseas? You know, you, you mentioned uh, flying into Berlin and then and then going to Czechoslovakia. How'd you um, no into Prague? Right, you were you were in Prague. Correct. Right? It was for a Veeam backup conference. Yep. Yeah. And, how'd, you, um, how'd you feel about the local tech when you were there? I mean, did it was it easy to get connected places? What about your phone? Yeah, let me start with the car, right? So you're renting a car. And in Europe, when I was there for a month in 2014, it was like 800 to rent a Hertz rental car for a five-week period. 
but that's stick shift standard or 1600 for automatic. So let's start with that. I get to Avis in Berlin's crummy Tegel Airport. Uh, it's old, right? They're trying to get rid of it, but that's why a budget airline goes there, Aer Lingus. And um, a small rental desk, and I got lucky. Um, I just politely asked, do you happen to have an automatic? And he gave it to me for the same price as manual. I was like, ooh, cool. Um, I knew how to drive a stick ship, but you know, if my wife was going to drive whatever, that's that's a bonus. Then it turns out it's a Mazda 3. He was going to give me something with like 18 miles per gallon. I'm like, oh, gosh, we're driving like over 1,000 miles. You got something better. So using that angle, pushing him to a better gas mileage, smaller car, he was happy to give me automatic rather than the standard large car gas guzzler he was going to give me. So then we have Bluetooth and a nice Mazda 3 that was brand new. All of that was fine. Then challenge number one, even though I downloaded maps with Google, uh, Google Maps, offline, offline mode for maps for the countries and the roads I was traveling, because I wasn't sure if my data that we were sharing was really going to suffice. What do you know? It doesn't show your speed limit. Both Waze, Apple Maps, Google Maps wouldn't show your current speed limit. And you're driving a different country and it's kilometers per hour and it's changing or they have no signs at all. And you really don't want a speeding ticket to show up a month later in your home mailbox, right? Luckily, uh, 1,400 miles, no incidents, no speeding tickets. And um, But those little things, they do get to you. 1,400 miles is a lot of time in the rental car. And you really do need to know what's the current speed limit. And it's just weird how in Europe, they just weren't telling me that, even with full you know, internet. Never mind the offline map mode, even with internet, which my Verizon plan was sufficient to get through the um, 10 days there. That is frustrating to not know what the current speed limit is in these different countries, including the rules about when you enter a local city and it shows you're entering a city. You're supposed to know the speed limits 30 kilometers per hour. Then they have a city end sign with a big X to it. What does that mean? Why do I care that the city just ended? You're supposed to know that means the speed limit went back to the normal 50 or 60 kilometers per hour there, which is still low. So all that stuff, it's not really tech, but it is related. It's the stuff yeah. you fly in your travel bag with. What do you equip that rental car with so you're comfortable driving around? And that was a challenge. Um, better than four years ago and pretty decent internet speed and all that. And Verizon was just, it was $10 per country per day. Sounds good until you realize when we drove to Czech Republic, that's two of our phones, my wife and I, getting hit when as soon as you land in Berlin and turn it on, that's 10 bucks times two, 20. Then you drive over the Prague, uh, Czech Republic border, another 20. So in one day you can hit $40, right? Just to have your internet. So we, we learned by the end of the trip, let's just do it with one phone and turn off data on the other one, right? So. Those are the little tips there, Jim. Um, yeah, it, you... it's. I found driving too, and I went to. I, I flew to Frankfurt a couple of years ago with my mom, and it, you just. It's just such a different. You know, you. Um, the, the signs are different. The the posted like you mentioned, posted speed limit. We we forget how much is assumed, even here in America. You know, there's a lot of things that are kind of assumed. Yeah, and it's it's stressful. You know, and and I was going to get a data plan when I got over there and I ended up bringing the wrong phone and it didn't work and it wasn't unlocked properly. And so, uh, you know, I, then I was just flying blind at that point. We, we were doing paper maps and, and actually I traveled Europe the first time when I lived over there, I traveled Europe completely on paper. We, this was 87. We didn't have, <laughs> we didn't have any of that stuff. And so I kind of learned to navigate kind of the old fashioned way, you know, on paper maps and, and, and Germany is notorious. I don't know about you, but their road signs are terrible. Like it, yeah, it's just, like am I on the autobahn? Is speed yeah. limit unlimited here? You can, good luck telling. <laughs> like, right. um, or the you can go twenty minutes without seeing a speed limit sign. You're like, well, was it 130 kilometers per hour here or not? Yeah. So uh, there's that. Um, hey, uh, quick story too. Before international travel, not a great idea to do person or business travel. And I was in Buffalo, New York, presenting at the user group the day before flying to Europe. What do you know? The weather stinks. All kinds of flights canceled. Uh, the airline wants to redirect me through Charlotte. I'm like, ah, it's 9 p.m. I leave internationally at 5 p.m. the next day from Bradley Air Airport. I had to get home and I'm thinking about rental car because the airline's offering to fly me to Charlotte, which they're going to leave me abandoned there because of the bad weather. And I get stuck in Charlotte at midnight where there's no way I can drive home on time to make the international flight. So what do you know? I'm getting a rental car, driving home, looking at the clock, looking at how much sleep I can get, realizing I had about an hour and a half to mow the lawn and pack for Europe when I get home. So I better be organized. <laughs> so during that six hours of quality time with myself driving from Buffalo back to Connecticut, you know, I'm, I'm doing some voice dictation of here's the things I got to remember to grab before I leave. And luckily I didn't forget anything too important on that trip, but man, it helps to be organized. And that's just a little story of how life kind of, you know, changes things. I thought it'd be fine. I get home for before, uh, 24 hours before the conference, uh, before the international flight from the conference. And no, I and it ended up, I had about 90 minutes to pack <laughs> for a 10 day business trip uh, with personal side trips. So, it worked out well, though. It was a lot of fun. I only 
got to do it like every four years. I don't travel internationally very often. Um, it's quite an adventure. I totally enjoyed it, especially having my wife with me. I've had so many, probably two decades of business trips without her, right? Especially overseas. Nothing quite like having, you know, someone in your family with you. It's awesome. Did you have any, did you have any problems paying for anything while you were over there? Or was it did, yeah. just credit card travel? How'd that, how'd that work for you? Apple pay? You're an Apple guy with me. I haven't really embraced Apple pay yet, but did that, did that work over there? Some places, yes, but bathrooms, not so much. Nope. You better have some coins or euros if you're going to a bathroom in Germany at 1030 at night trying to find a hotel before your 5 a.m. You know, departure for a flight. That's what we ran into. You get to it and that's like, oh, gosh, we got to go to the ATM, find the ATM, uh, pull out money at this gas station just to use the turnstile to get into a bathroom where you're basically paying to clean the bathroom. So those little things, right, that trip you up. It's like, well, this is interesting. I have to go real bad, but I got to find where an ATM is so I can just get into the bathroom. Just need change. Yeah, you need to keep pocket change. And we're in three countries, right? So you're going to keep change for each country? Not so much. Uh, so it was Euros in Germany and uh, Prague. Careful. Uh, Poland was not. Um, oh, actually, Prague. Yeah, no, we had to keep different currencies on us. So yeah, uh, Apple Pay. Uh, the logos, just like here, often don't tell you. You look for some sort of wireless thing and you try the phone and sometimes it would work, sometimes it didn't. My article talks a little bit about that too. Um, you know, the traveling challenges there. They're, they're just not keen on putting the Google Pay and Apple, sorry, Google and Apple logos. All they do is have like a generic Wi-Fi icon looking thing. Put your phone near it and cross your fingers. When I'd say it, people knew English well enough in the big cities to at least know what you're saying, but they, they usually didn't even know if it would work. They're like, no, try it. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, also, Apple Pay tied to AMP, American Express, not good in Europe. <laughs> American Express, not a surprise, but if you have Apple Pay with Visa also in your Apple Pay wallet, you're good to go at way more places. There you go. So those little tips might help someone out there. You get to do some travel. When um, you, you were talking about the bathroom, we had gotten to Germany and the next day I was taking my mom out to some place and I'd forgotten that you needed the change, you know, mm. and I was still trying to figure out euros. <clears throat> and so um, <clears throat> I get to the turnstile, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's like, it's like whatever to get in 25, you know, 25 cents or whatever, you know, the yep. a coin. So I'm, I'm in front of the turnstile. I kind of back away to let other people through and I'm, I got my hand open and I'm trying to figure this out. <laughs> a really helpful German just comes by and lifts. Like he just looks in my hand. He doesn't even ask. He just looks in my hand, lifts out what I need and gives it to me. <laughs> I was like, thank you. Thank you. You know? And, uh, and so later he, um, so he got me through the turnstile and, and my mom through the turnstile. So when we were coming back out, they, I, I don't know about where, where you went, but they give you, when you go through, they give you a little receipt and you get that credit amount back. If you use it at the, you know, they have a little convenience store in there. And if you use it there, they give you the credit back. It's, it was, it was kind of cool. So I went yeah, to buy, I a soda. yeah, yeah. I went <laughs> to buy a soda and, and um, the guy was behind me. So he, he asked me in English, he's like, you know, Hey, you know, where, where are you going? And I said, oh, we're going to Schweinfurt. And that's where I had been stationed in the military. But like nobody goes to, just goes to Schweinfurt, especially in the middle of the, we were in there in the spring. And he, he was so funny. He was like, why would you go to Schweinfurt? You know, and he just <laughs> gives me this really funny look. I said, I was stationed there in the 80s in the military. Oh, he kind of got it. But it was, it was really, it was really um, kind of, uh, it was comforting to have kind of some locals at that point not treat me like an American, which they should have to yep. just be helpful. Um, I actually found Germany to be a really helpful country uh, when, when we did that. I, I don't know what your experience was across those countries, but whenever I was struggling, somebody almost always would come help me. And uh, it was pretty obvious I was American. I mean, that, there, was no, there was no doubt in that. And so I, I found that. Did you find, were, were people helpful at all that, that, uh, that, that as you traveled around, did you find people helpful or was it standoffish? We didn't spend much time in Germany. That was our getting in and out of Berlin airport and driving quickly to the Polish border where my wife is from. She hadn't been there in 38 years since she uh, moved out as a 14 year old. So that was really meaningful um, from a family perspective to get back to Poland. And as soon as we crossed the border, she's comfortable in convenience stores. There was no need for me, right? <laughs> I was great, like, whew, this is awesome. Once we got to Poland, no problems. Uh, I didn't have a clue what's going on, but as long as she did, right? Kind of like um, having back, a local. Yep, but back to Germany. Yeah, I struggled when I was there for five weeks back in 2014. I really struggled. Like I go to a, 
at a, um, an Indian restaurant and the folks there don't speak German or English. <laughs> and then we're using Google Translate, just struggling, you know. This, I didn't have too much of that. I had, had my wife with me a lot of the time. In Prague, we were actually just all at a conference hotel, all speaking English from all over the world with uh, about 40 oh, people in the Veeam Vanguard program. It was fantastic. Um, kind of like uh, MVPs for Microsoft, Veeam backup company does this for Vanguards. They have 300,000 customers. So they're also a pretty big company. And what a delight to be with bloggers from all over the world that I've read their stuff for years, to be in physically in a room with them in Europe. It's just awesome. It's yeah. a blast. That's, that's super great. Hey, Kevin is asking in the chat room, have you done any articles on setting up a home lab for VMware vSAN? Mm. The price point to do vSAN right, to get all compatible hardware, not this consumer you'd actually drive, but Optane that's meant for the right endurance. You're looking at five figures, not exactly a home lab friendly project. That's why I got creative with that empty naked motherboard in the desk there where you have eight NVMe drives. Now you're talking about nesting. I have not spent a lot of time blogging about it because it sends kind of a mixed message like that it's a good idea to roll your own home lab with whatever the heck hardware you have laying around. That is not the message for my day job customers because that is not a good formula for uh, stability and a resilient environment in, a, in, a, in the corporate world. Um, you really need hardware that's on the vSAN compatibility list for good reasons. Um, not just warranty, but you know, right endurance. The caching layer gets abused heavily with vSAN. You can do it though, and then people do it. Um, virtually Ghetto, uh, William Lamb, and many other bloggers have all sorts of articles about, um, you know, roll your own home labs with what, uh, you know, Intel Nooks and, and lots of categories of product. I've tried to focus on supported products that are fully on the vSphere 6, 7 compatibility list, but cracking that nut to get to an affordable vSAN, a small one, mind you, where maybe core count and CPU quality doesn't matter as much, but you still need 10 gig networking and a 10 gig switch you're still looking at a few thousand dollars. So that's a pretty niche audience that would really want to do that. And a lot of people want to do one U, tiny, and those are loud. And I'm not really interested in leaving really loud machines running 24 seven on my house. So that's why I've tended to focus on the, the mini towers, which they can do vSAN. And I try valiantly behind the scenes for years because I know there's pent up demand for more affordable vSAN. So yeah, that's my kind of part of my skunk works. Test it, try the speeds out at home. And then try to convince, you know, coworkers and others kind of grassroots through Twitter to get some more affordable vSAN capable machines, you know, made. And I have not given that up. <laughs> if anything, I've dug my heels in more and trying hard behind the scenes with a variety of companies, not just uh, Supermicro and some of the more affordable companies. So stay tuned on that, Jim. Okay. I keep try keep chugging away on that. No, sounds good. You want to stay you want to stay close to to uh, Paul's blog. We, we want to talk a little bit about home automation. And you've recently we a, a while ago you were early into Ring, but you had an Insteon fail as well. So why don't you talk about that? Yeah, I finally moved from X10, which was crummy, to, to uh, I think 2012 maybe uh, to an Insteon hub. And um, yeah, I should have bought two of them because it failed like. A couple days ago. So that meant the front lights in the house weren't going off at sunset like they've been doing for seven years. So it's not really a fail. If you have a product for well, six years, I think, that's not bad for an $80 hub, right? Cool. But I should have bought two because <laughs> now I had to find it on eBay and I got to wait a full week. So the lights aren't going on. It's a little annoying. And then I got to remarry the devices. So I'm not even sure what I'm in, in, in for. This is like early day of cloud. So Instagram does rely on a username, password, and login. And, and you can do it through the app, but it's really a centralized server. Will it seamlessly handle a new hub needing to be married to all these Instant devices that were married to an old hub? Or do I have to like divorce them, zap them and repair them? Well, 20 some odd devices that could turn into half a Saturday, which I'm gonna, I kind of resent, right? But still I had a good six years. And now um, to replace it all with some other brand would be a nightmare. It's just a hub we're talking about, $80 device. But yeah, it just shows, um, you know, it's something as simple as turning on and off your lights at sunset and turning them off at midnight. That simple project just wasn't as simple as I hoped. It was successful with Insteon and it was relatively affordable, but man, it, nothing lasts in technology these days that long. Rarely six years is, is a good run. And um, hopefully I can just continue that because I don't really have an interest in keep pumping money into that and replacing Gigilus because it's, it's really a time sink, not just a money sink. Um, so a successful project, but a, a little bit of a fail. And the way it failed is you can't even ping it. You know, the ethernet light pulses, Try to reset it to factory defaults. That doesn't seem to work. Can't ping it. It's a brick, right? So there's my little story for you. Do I regret it? No. Back then, um, had the most best ecosystem. It penetrates all over my house. All the devices work flawlessly. X10 never delivered that to me. And it had a bridge for uh, smoke detectors. And, um, you know, it's been good. 
so yeah, I've got articles about that. I just mentioned a little footnote. It just happened a couple of days ago. It was fresh on my mind. Did you so have the, you ordered the new hub? I have, but I couldn't find it anywhere that can get it in one or two days. So I have to wait like a week for it to ship from California to Connecticut. So there was no accelerated shipping option. I just live with it. Mm -hmm. so. Is it used? Mm, it was new in box, supposedly. We'll yeah. see. If I believe that, e right? Is e it the six-year-old product? Yeah, as eBay only. Yeah. yeah, that that happens. Any device, right? Luckily, the company has not orphaned it. It's still going strong. We're good there. It would be a disaster if it was one of those companies where they literally went out of business, turned yeah. off the cloud, and now you have a bunch of little bricks around your house. Mm -hmm. This is not like that. Not a big deal. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to be in that kind of situation because I try all these different kinds. So I buy onesies, twosies to just try yeah. more. I get sent them. And so I use them and then quickly get dependent on them and we'll review them. And then they just like, most of the companies like just keep them, you know, we don't really want them back. So I leave yeah. them running for whatever. And then, you know, a service goes out, like you said, a service goes out and they're just, they brick them, you know, they just yep. don't work anymore. And that's the way we're headed, right? Like, um, Euro, a hockey puck that's maintained by a company. You're paying good money for that product, a premium of like 350 bucks for a three pack these days of Euro and two uh, remote modules in the, the base. You're paying a subscription, basically. You don't have to pay a monthly bill, but you're paying for a premium product that's gonna have years of support and hundreds of thousands of people on there with you. And it's been good. Their stability has been excellent. Their firmware updates have been good and their support's been excellent. So Eero is a big success story, another internet of things success story where I had to kind of give up on managing things with a local IP address and a local browser and not have to rely on a cloud well. Eero kind of proved me wrong that I need to get used to firmware updates every month or two and and have the full backing and support of a company that stands by their product at a little higher price point than the you know cheap routers I was used to and cheap Wi-Fi I was used to. Totally worth it. Mesh has been a game changer. You've talked about that. So has Dave McKay for years. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. It's been a fantastic leap forward. I get a gigabit down and 37 up on Cox Gigablast in my home. Um, and uh that's been good and then the wi-fi i can actually run the little euro benchmark and get like upwards of 800 megabytes per second on its little benchmark realistically it's lower than that most websites don't let you do that but when you run a synthetic benchmark even on wi-fi the speeds have gotten fantastic thanks to little euro and a processor that actually keeps up in a relatively affordable box um and our next topic jim um yeah you you recently yeah, wi-fi bought some and you recently yeah. bought some ring stick-up cams Exactly. So Wi-Fi is important, right? So if you stand at your front doorbell and you hold your phone and you can barely see one bar of Wi-Fi signal, you're in trouble for a Ring video doorbell or a Nest video doorbell. It doesn't matter. You're in trouble, right? Ring fixed all that for me. That laid the groundwork two years ago, two and a half years ago with uh, Insteon, fixed and laid the groundwork for Ring for me. I've been on a video doorbell for I think a year and a half and now adding some stick up cams. So Amazon deliveries, Jim. I have a big plastic box. I need to give you a link for that. It's been 60%, uh, 70% of the time, um, Amazon or FedEx or USPS on Sundays these days, or finally UPS, we actually use the box that's you know rainproof and just all they have to do is dump a box inside a large plastic box like this high, this wide on my front step. Cool, hides packages from the street, but more important, keeps them out of the rain. Cool. Still though, if you're going away for multiple days or you travel for work, you kind of want to know everything that's going on the front step and dirty little secret about Ring, almost every review you read they rarely talk about the down camera angles, terrible. Same with Nest. Mm -hmm. You don't see what's on your front step right in front of the doorbell, which is often where they're leaving stuff. That's an issue. So uh, ring stick up cam, the black one with battery operated, that seems to be lasting me. It's gonna look like two or three months before recharges. So I'm cool with that. Um, put that somewhere near your front and get a side view and see everything that's on your front step. So it's not super obvious when you're not home for a day or two. So that's been a success story, Jim. Uh, but it's just, a smaller product, smaller than their full-blown spotlight cams that have a built-in LED light and all. It's about half the size and half volume. So now it's more discreet and you can tuck it in more places, uh, you know, near the front of your house. So mm -hmm. if you have any questions about that, yeah, I got an article. I see you already have a link for it. Cool. I appreciate that, Jim. Um, yeah. No, we we uh, interviewed these guys, but Zmoto is in this space as well, and they have some stick-up cams. They run. They do it a little bit different. But but yeah, and I'm I am not gonna put we're moving this summer, I think. And so I don't want to put a full doorbell, you know, camera. And and what you mentioned, the angle is never great for that. And so we've put that, um, I've put that on an angle on the outside facing down and can see the entire porch now. Plus actually the approach to the porch, which has been cool. good. 
And like yep. you said, the battery, I get two, two or three months on the battery and then, and then I need to charge it for a couple hours and put it, snap it right back in and I'm good to go. That has really been a game changer. The, the, the Sarah has picked up on that and we installed the app on her phone. And for the first time she's, cause she kept asking me, Hey, can you check your phone to see if there's a package there? I'm like, well, you, you could have this on your phone. Like it's not, it's not me. And so we put the app on her phone and uh, she's, so now we can see. Here at Christmas time, I mean, we're getting two or three packages a day. And then I bought a whole bunch of stuff after Christmas too, that it's coming in. It really, really helpful. I hadn't thought about getting a nice, a nice box just to put on the, on the porch, weight it down and, and, uh, and have, they'll, they'll put it in there. If you, do you just, do you label it in some way or do they, do they just know? <laughs> I did. I should make a PDF of the label. I have all the logos in there. Again, sometimes they don't use it once on the ring camera. I had footage of the guy. Uh, leaving a package in front of the box that I bought that was clearly labeled for deliveries in the rain, no plastic bag. And I just sent that footage because Ring lets you share a URL with, you know, Amazon support. Just saying, hey, I have an Amazon business account. You guys have been doing a great job for years, but this is kind of weird. I have this box and it's in the rain. You didn't even bother putting in plastic. Is there something that can be done to notate the account that I prefer a plastic bag if it's raining or put it in the box I bought for the front of the house because they don't really leave you. They give you special instructions with the drop down menu, front door, rear door, porch, garage. That's all you can do. I'm like, can you notate the account somewhere? And then, and it worked for a week or two. They seem to be leaving stuff in the box all the time. I think Amazon might've done something to the account. But anyhow, so I appreciate you bringing that topic. You brought up Ring, right? Jamie, I was so proud that you landed him in an interview. That was awesome, Jim. Um, and being able to quote, you know, your name in my article talking about Ring Video Doorbell and my long, you know, I went with the first one and ended up with the pro and some issues I had. And, and there was one video that had the wrong audio and I reported that and Jamie himself, you know, chimed in on my blog. That That's the power of blogging. It was awesome. Link bait stuff and ads, there's not much money in that, as you know. It's about helping, like helping engineers with problems I had with the ring with a little lower voltage transformer. I had beefy enough wiring, I went with a bigger transformer, all my problems went away, I blog about it. That's the fun part of blogging. And then having Jamie himself, the CEO of Ring, who got you know bought a ton of money from Amazon, having him actually read it and try to address the concern and fix it. That's the fun part for me, right? Is working with vendors, having an article that uh, you know people actually read and get value from. And sometimes I'll be honest, I'll share Google Analytics with a vendor saying, hey, this article's been out six months, it surprised me, it's got you know, 10,000 plus readers, could you help try to get me a straight answer on this technical question that's popped up like five times over last month? That's super fun for me on home lab stuff, Internet of Things stuff. And now edge computing Internet of Things, those buzzwords you hear all the time, it's all converging. These tiny little servers with NVMe are starting to be on cell phone towers and they're starting to be in VMware's product portfolio where you have edge computing devices managed by VMware software. Um, you have fancier and fancier, uh, you know, Home automation devices, we talked about a little bit for Internet of Things. It's kind of a phrase you used maybe two, three years ago, IoT. It's now showing up in more and more products in the enterprise, in the automotive industry, and in other places. So it's exciting times where the seven years of blogging, everything's sort of meshing together in the last like, year for me. I'm really enjoying that. And getting to know more and more people at it, Intel and Supermicro and HP and Lenovo and all, has been a lot of fun for me. That's part of the good part of traveling in this job. You get to go to conferences where you meet these other companies. And man, those conversations are fun. Um, and they add value to my blog because uh, now I know somebody I can ask a question when it comes up. And it does. It's so well, you're really you're really good at making those relationships. I think the key on that is to realize these companies, you mentioned Jamie. Jamie was just on uh Richard, Richard Gunther's uh home on about yeah. uh, I think two episodes ago. And you know, for he's worth a billion dollars. Like, I mean, the, 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 yep. the guy is, you know, now, uh, he has, you know, sold Amazon. I mean, and yet he came on Richard's show. I bet if I asked him, he'd come back on this show. Like, and that's, what's cool, right? That shows his character. Like you're buying an ecosystem when you do internet of things, you're investing in a ring doorbell. And I told my wife that like, I don't know if this is going to work out this ring. And a month later I needed the pro. The first one didn't work out so well. Right. But I learned a lot and it was a bit of a time sink, but I blogged like crazy about it. I had a blast. And I feel good that he stood behind the product, including when there was a flaw. People read those signals, right? They want to know if there's a problem, has anyone blogged about it? Guess what? My site doesn't hold back. I, warts and all, if something goes wrong, I tell people. Um, that's always been how I am. And it's really fun when the vendor replies in a constructive way. It's not because I try to bash anyone. Most of my articles are positive. They're about successful 
known good products where I've used them for a month or even a year in my home and then I blog about it, right? That's a little different than most people do where it's just link baby the first day a press release came out. They don't even have their hands on it. That's not me. I don't have time like for that. Um, I like getting my hands on it and then telling people a success story, including some problems, right? Um, so thank, yeah, no, thank you. Um, so Jim, the next topic, you and I have a bunch in common, right? We, uh, my dad served in the military. He was in Germany. It turns out you did. Uh, USA is probably both our insurance. Am I correct on that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, USA, another thing. Yeah. Uh, our sons have the same name, which is kind of funny. We're about the same age. All these weird coincidences, right? But here's another one. 2006 Honda Civic Hybrid. That rings a bell as something you drive around, right? And I remember seeing it. when exactly we Exactly the same car. Like uh -huh. exactly the same car. And what do you know? We met at one of the meetups and we kind of laughed about that. Like, my gosh, we own the same car. Yeah. So when you were shopping, my wife had the 2005 Civic already. I knew the 2006 were coming out soon. I needed to test drive it. Would it actually have enough acceleration with a family of four in the car as they grew into full adults, right? I was worried about that because I knew in the hybrid 2005 model, which is basically a small battery pack added to an existing car design, I wasn't impressed with the acceleration. I was worried about that, right? It just didn't impress me. So the 2006 won me over. Um, and I went with the NAV, which was more expensive. I turned my car into almost, or with tax and all that, closer to 30,000, which is ridiculous for a 2006 Civic. But it also got me the full NAV, which let me do steering wheel controls of listening to your podcast, Jim, of course. Forward 15 seconds, back 15 seconds with the channel up, channel minus through a Bluetooth, like, sorry, through a wired module that pretended it was a CD changer. So I blogged about the Civic, my beloved Civic, for uh, many times, had it for 165,000 miles. And, so this and, is my... and by the way, you saved me a battery replacement on that. Oh, thing. cool. Because so you, you had said it, we were at the meetup, we were both in the nineties and you had said, Hey, I think he's like, my batteries just went bad. 90,000 90, for me. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. We were both, in the, we, I, I, we were almost in the exact same spot. And so <laughs> I started watching and sure enough, my, my, my battery pack went bad as well. And I had bought the extended warranty. I didn't do the nav package, but I did buy the extended warranty on the thing. And I was, I don't know, 3000 miles away from that thing expiring. And they took it in and they replaced $3,000 or $4,000 worth of batteries replaced on the extended warranty. It paid for itself. It was one of, but it, that's because you, like I was paying attention to what had happened to you. Now I'm not saying they failed because we said this, but that was one of those things I was just kind of watching and sure enough, the batteries failed on me, I don't know, four or five months later, and was able to get those replaced. Yeah, and um, for me, I've had a lot of you know crummy cars. I've had reliable cars like a Toyota Tercel when I was in my 20s. I've had a lot of cars, emphasis on mileage and just keeping the cost of owning it uh, low. That's been a priority, and that car succeeded. I am absolutely you know, thankful to Honda uh, you know, for that. Um, and... Even things like climate control, where I had the package where you could just set the dial. I drive a lot for work. I commuted to Boston and New York, and I live in Connecticut. Those are two-hour drives, but back and forth in a day. That's 200 miles sitting in the car. I had no regrets. Adding a Bluetooth kit, that car worked out really well. The seat was comfortable, you know, very happy with it. And um, it was a long-term investment, 13 years, 165,000 miles. Cool. So in my son's car, who, he lives in Pittsburgh now, one of my sons, um, Started having some reliability, some minor issues, but also we we're kind of thinking it'd be nice to give this car while it has some legs in it before it's, you know, completely in the ground. And um, so that kind of came up. So let me go back on my story a little bit. A year and a half ago, um, I started thinking about what happens when one of the kids needs a car in a hurry or their jobs change and suddenly you have got this urgent need. Will I be needing a car? And it got my wheels turning. So, you know, you might remember what was happening a year and a half ago. And if anyone's seen my blog post, they kind of already know the punchline here. Ah, Jim, so I used to play with remote control cars as an 11 year old in my backyard at my parents' house. And what do you think I did? Did I buy alkaline batteries or did I get rechargeable batteries for my little electric car, little electric remote control car as an 11 year old? Well, that was me, rechargeable batteries, right? It made sense to me. I could play for hours. I'd have an extra set of rechargeable batteries and keep on playing rather than just throwing alkaline batteries away, right? So here I am a year and a half ago thinking, wow, um, that same feeling I had with other products that I know they're gonna be big, Tesla Model 3 aiming for $35,000. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> uh, that interested me. It wasn't so much about the style, the car looks fantastic or the speed where the acceleration is amazing. It was mostly about, wow, if I own something 10 or 15 years and I drive it, close to 200,000 miles. Hmm, wouldn't it be cool to not be burning yet more fossil fuel, right? It got my attention. 
Then I started looking at, oh, when I bought the hybrid, Connecticut gave me $3,000 rebate. I also got my sales tax back because the dealership auto accidentally can't uh, charge me Connecticut sales tax. So it's nice to get a check in the mail and the dealership calling me a day later saying, hey, we got a check for you. Oops, we charged you sales tax. Those little things were in my head, along with driving in HOV lanes in New York when I was there with my 47 miles per gallon Honda Civic Hybrid on the highway during the summer, right? It's 33 miles per gallon in the mid of winter driving where the battery doesn't work so well. That's the reality of that car, but it's quite good either way. Oh. That that tickled my brain, like, gosh, what else is there from Tesla? A year and a half ago, there was nothing on the radar. And I had no idea if they'd pull it off a Model 3 in any kind of time frame. But I, I politely asked my wife, could I possibly get my place online with a $1,000 deposit? Just in case, as we knew our kids were getting done with college, we knew they'd be looking for jobs. We knew there was going to be a need to shuffle cars around, perhaps. So I didn't want to have to make a knee-jerk quick decision on a very expensive car if something broke with one of the kids or, or in, all of a sudden you're in a hurry, right? Something that big. I don't really want to hurry. I want to be very careful and deliberate. So luckily, Jim, things worked out where I'm in Connecticut, kind of a hostile state to Tesla, like Texas. They don't even have dealerships in Connecticut. So test drives were not forthcoming where my wife could see what it's like to drive one. So I just waited patiently, didn't really bring it up. Year and a half went by, didn't really watch videos, didn't think too much about it other than following Tesla and SpaceX a little bit, like, like I know you do. And you just talked about Tesla two weeks ago on your podcast. And I'm laughing like, wow, what timing? That you guys, you and Mike Weeger happen to bring up electric powered pickup trucks, he was talking yeah, about, right? Yeah. And he just brushed off that it cost 60000 I'm like, oh my God, 60000 Anyhow, I'm thinking 35000 for something that I can seat five comfortably. It's like between the size of the Civic and an Accord. So I'm already used to compact cars. That greatly appealed to me. Small cars, that's what I'm used to. So, um, test drive gets offered out of the blue in mid December. Tesla's on a big push to get people test drives because now, you know, uh, year end rebate is $7,500 is going away. So I put two and two together like, oh, wow, I got two weeks left. Maybe it's worth asking my wife now that a test drive is being offered 30 minutes from our house in Massachusetts. Maybe she'll spend some time on a Saturday. And off we went. And yeah, we were impressed. You've heard this over and over from people that have been driving a Tesla, actually owning it, not just reading blog posts about it. There is nothing like trying one just to get an idea of what it's like to be in a car that does not make the usual noises particularly under more 40 miles an hour, it's ridiculous. You feel like you're in a Jetsons car and to sum it up, like you're driving the future. <laughs> um, it sounds like a whir, like in the Jetsons, like when you're in a little spaceship, right? It's it's incredible. Um, I don't have enough superlatives, but it happened, right? So I got the test drive three days later. I'm talking to my wife seriously about it. We're having a family meeting. And now I find myself in a New York City hotel room with a few hours off from work one day needing to finance from USAA, getting a low interest, figure all that out now that, you know, the kids' uh, finances are, are kind of squared and college loans and all that stuff all squared. They have their jobs. The sequencing worked out where, okay, maybe I'm actually ordering and not waiting necessarily for the short range, 35000 Maybe I'm stepping it up to a little longer range where I get to Boston and back. Not only did it work out, December 23rd, we took delivery of our Tesla Model 3 in silver, the long range model. And I had a chance to drive to Boston and back twice in one week. Uh, one of my sons lived near Boston, another um, trip to leave, leave him off. It worked out. Um, it's been awesome, Jim. It was all a whirlwind. It all started like December 20th and what you, uh, December 18th in the test drive, turned into taking delivery of a car just a week later, overnighting the finances and all that stuff. So thank goodness for low interest rates and for uh, how quick things have gotten when you need to do a major purchase like that, getting proof of insurance and financing all that. I did that all in one day in Manhattan, walking to a Tesla dealership two miles away to make sure I knew what color I wanted to see it firsthand. And I feel incredibly blessed and fortunate. I can't believe what I'm driving compared to the 67 Dodge I started with that an uncle gave me when I turned 16 to this. I'm delighted to see what's happened in, you know, our years in the planet together, Jim. Yeah. It's remarkable. No, I'm, I mean, holy smokes. That. that is, I'll throw that link in the chat room. So, um, you know, that is, that's one of those, that's a big deal. And it is. In, in your, in your blog post, let me, let me encourage folks uh, head over to the average guy.tv slash HGG three, eight, five. And we'll have the link to Paul's post. It's more than just a post. Cause you have like a table of contents in this post of all the various things. Um, Paul, I also see some dates. So I'm assuming you chronicle, you've got some updates from each day after you bought it leading up to yep. buying it. By the way, we had Dwayne on, I don't know, about six weeks ago. You know, he he got a Tesla as well. And he also has an interesting story. 
if you're new to the channel you sh and you're thinking about a Tesla, you should go back and hear Dwayne's story. It's pretty interesting. Just, just uh, I think if you put uh, Tesla in the search bar, you'll probably see Dwayne's post on that. But have you been kind of updating on your post, kind of some 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 experience with it? Absolutely, including Tesla's back order and all the chargers. There's a mad rush for people to get their $7,500 rebate that got halved January 1st and then disappears in July. So the conversations with the family were along the lines of, all that changes if I wait a few more months is I spend more for the same car, right? And then once I realized I really do need to get to Boston and back pretty often for my current job and probably future jobs, meaning of several years of driving a fair amount for my job, it holds a great deal of appeal to get a 110, ooh, my article has the uh, sticker, 110, let me make sure I got the specs right, miles per gallon equivalent. In other words, far less cost per mile, uh, personal cost, right? So you're on business travel, and what is it, 54 and a half cents a mile or whatever, or personal travel, either way, just being with my mom and dad in Cambridge, Mass, we're sitting on a bridge in traffic, what do you know, an EV license plate car is in front of me. I then look at the rest of the car thinking that license plate looks cool. It shows a little plug in. It's a Tesla Model 3 in silver, the same car I'm in, right in front of me. And it just dawned on me like what I'm looking at with my mom. There's no tailpipes. She gets it, I get it. We're just freaking excited <laughs> that it's possible. And it's just remarkable. I know it's risky. I know it's expensive. I know we might have some niggling issues. I can't wait to listen to Dwayne. You caught me. I didn't catch that episode. I caught, caught Mike Weaker talking about two weeks ago. I've heard mm -hmm. some horror stories about some quality issues in the beginning. My bin number is at 119,000. I'm well into the production, right? A year and a half in. I think most of the early concerns behind, right? They changed some stuff. Um, I know there's some risk, just like with the Ring Video doorbell. And I bought that thing when it was brand new, including the Pro. Um, there's always risk to early adopter. But I do shop carefully, and I blog like crazy about it, warts and all. And you'll find that the only issue I have is one fog light that gets a little fogged up. Which, by the way, my 2006 Honda Civic Hybrid, its fog lights lit up, um, broke so many times and fogged up that I finally just pulled them out. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's just kind of ironic that the, the same thing, fog lights, are the only issue, significant issues, I noticed near delivery of both cars. The Civic, it took like a year for them to start fogging up. The Tesla fogged up. The first rain, you know, my wife noticed. My heart sank a little bit. It's like, gosh, if that's it, rear view mirrors work. They tuck in fine. All the mirrors and doors open fine. All the latches work, trunk lights, everything's fine. I'm like, phew, if that's the worst thing that happened my first week in 800 miles now in the odometer in about 10 days, I think I'm good. Um, I could be horribly wrong and have to eat my words no. in a month, but I went public on it. Whatever happens, I'm still going to go public. It could be horribly embarrassing if it's a disaster but I don't think it's gonna be. And my God, does it bring a smile to my face every time I have a, uh, get to drive somewhere. Um, it's just awesome. Um, yeah, it accelerates like crazy. <laughs> Dwayne was um, on 374 talking about his his Tesla purchase. It's pretty hilarious. The, the what did he get, do you know? Model S, the bigger one? Or? Yeah, I think he did. Yeah. yeah. He got the Model S. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah he did. Yeah, so he, it's the second half of the show. So he talks about conversational AI and the work he's doing with Microsoft up front. And then on the back half of the show, we talk uh, about, oh, that's the show. Uh, yeah, the back half of the show, we talk about his car. The um, That was the show he had Thursday Night Football going on on his TV behind him. And <laughs> yet the YouTube tagged that video. And it, it tagged it in the one I uploaded. It tagged it in the... Uh, Post show, it tagged it in the live show, and they went in the NFL wouldn't let me. So I had to take that video down. It's only available in our RSS feed. Uh, if you want to go out and get it that way, but we got tagged. Yeah, we got tagged on uh, by the NFL on that one. Well, um, one more thing about the the investment and the risk. So let me just say this: um, going public. And like this, right? Something such a big product. I spent years, you know, building up a reputation, things like, um, you know, being honest in posts. There's a lot at stake when it's something that's tens of thousands of dollars, right? It's a little bit daunting or scary. Um, but I figure, what the heck? I mean, for seven years, I've written almost a thousand articles. Why would I change that and just hide that I own this car that I have fun looking at, fun touching the display, looking at the different tweaks, um, the different minor concerns but mostly not a big deal heads up display in a honda civic is way up there near the dash my mazda 3 driving all over europe it literally had a reflective heads up display that i was too tall to see so i'm wedging paper in there to try to make it taller so i could see it 
So that was kind of a fail. Um, and then there's this car where you're looking a little bit down to the right. Not a big deal. I got used to that very quickly. Uh, no big deal at all. Um, not having physical buttons. Literally, when you're sitting there, it's austere and simple. I'm absolutely fine with it. Having my money go towards what arguably is the safest car in America right now, certainly for a small car, it's unbelievable. Having a low center of gravity, uh, a roll bar above my head, but all glass, meaning you have a sunroof in the back seat and headroom in the back seat as a six foot one person with a tall torso. I'm super happy with the car. It's way bigger than a Mazda 3 or Honda Civic in the back seat. None of those new cars are good in the back seat. Um, I'm just delighted. And it's only, was it five? I put the specifications compared. It's four inches wider and five inches longer. It's less than an Accord in size. So it's between an Accord and Civic. And you'll see I have a picture of the two of them next to each other. Um, now, here's the thing to sum it up dual motor for snowy driving. But it also gives you ridiculous acceleration of four and a half seconds, zero to 60. Was that what I, was that what I need? If Honda made, they stopped the hybrid, by the way, on the Civic line. They went with the Insight or other models, like an Accord. If Honda made something 30% less costly to fight off the Tesla Model 3 and half the acceleration, I could deal with zero to 60 in nine seconds. Look, I've been on a hybrid where it's upwards of 10. It's slow, right? As you know, it's not an or amazing never. car. It's You're never in that car. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. So I'm used yeah. to that, right? Yeah. I'm not picking on that. I would be more than happy if I could present to the family when we had this meeting two weeks ago, such an option. It doesn't exist, Jim. In three years or two years, hopefully, we're looking at Volvo and others getting in the game and maybe even Toyota and, and the big brands, but they're not there yet. And the charging network's not there. So charging, kind of niche. Um, yes, if you own a Tesla, you'd care about what I have to do in my garage. But you know, if you Go ahead and check out the article. I'll get into that. But the fact that the local dealerships and in Connecticut, they don't have the parts in stock, kind of annoying for the first two, three, four weeks. You're waiting for an electrician and you're waiting for the right plug type. Meanwhile, you're charging at about five miles per hour. So overnight, you only get 50 miles more range. That's not you know so practical. You drive to a supercharger, you get 170 miles uh, pumped into your tank of electrons in half an hour. That's awesome. And guess what? It's four miles from my house behind Red Robin. Cool. We went and used that twice as a family just to try it. So I'm good, you know, but no boohoo me limping along. But it is an interesting story of what you got to do to, you know, get an electrician in your house and, and all that. Um, but it's so cool seeing my walking in the garage, seeing my, you know, a charger hanging from the ceiling. In my case, so you don't trip over the cord, pop it out, drive away. I'm cool with that. I actually had an RV where I was kind of used to that uh, 12 years ago. So this is kind of returning to plugging in my thing when I get to the garage. So, um Okay, enough of the kind of why and the justification, a little bit about the, the money angle where I wish something existed cheaper. It just doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. Tesla went high end and moved their way down to 35,000. They weren't secretive about that. They said that's their plan. They're using the Model S, the money makers with the bigger profit margin, like what Dwayne bought, right? To subsidize me to get to the masses of $35,000 cost, which is the average car price in America right now. Keep that in mind, right? That's a big deal to do that. All right. Here's the fun part, Jim. Driving home today, I'm thinking, what do I say in the podcast that's different that people might not have read on any other Tesla article or any electric car article? You might think it'd be incredibly quiet on the highway. You'd be wrong. It depends on the texture of the surface of the highway. If you're on a loud surface, concrete that's you know ribbed or concrete that's just kind of bumpy or old asphalt, your tire noise is still mostly what you're hearing on the highway, including the truck next to you with its you know loud brakes and stuff. You're still going to hear that. Your car's motor, like in the Civic Hybrid, are 2,800 RPM on the highway. You're not really hearing that. You're hearing wind noise around the rear view mirror, side view mirrors, excuse me. And you're hearing a low coefficient of friction on large speed utilities, or, but not in our hybrid, right? You and I have pretty low coefficient of friction on our older Civics, like remarkable. Today's have all kinds of mud flaps and weird, goofy angles at the front. It's like they've tossed caution in the wind and miles per gallon in the wind and just said, heck with it. We're going to go muscular and youthful and forget coefficient of friction. I love that Tesla looks kind of similar to my Civic. Take a look at the side-by-side -side picture. They're not that different. They're swoopy, they're efficient. That's like a, that's cool. But what it does mean in my story is, yeah, up to 50 miles an hour, it's dramatically different than my hybrid. Pulling out of a stop sign, nobody's seeing that you just got to 30 miles an hour before you crossed to the other side of this intersection. It's incredible. You're not making a scene, you're just quietly giving your, self a little thrill as you zip up to the speed limit of 35. It's remarkable. That's not the most efficient to do. And you're not going to do that to your whiplashed, you know, passengers as the driver, though, you know, when to hold your neck muscle. And we could talk about that. If you're not ready with the neck muscles or you haven't worn anyone else in the car, they're not going to be pleased with you if you floor it. They will notice. They might even get upset. I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> but in my mom's case, 
She giggled uncontrollably. I warned her and then I did it. And hearing my mom and dad's reaction to the most acceleration they felt in their life, better than a roller coaster, better than anything, way better than a jet plane. My God, it was a blast. Um, so yes, nice that it has that. Another thing is just that jets and sound, you hear a little whirring in the motor. Um, here's the little things, Jim, getting in and going. You park at Walgreens to go to the pharmacy. What do you do? You put the car in park by pushing a button on the right-hand stock. It says P, that's it, you're done. Push the button to get out of the car, walk out, walk away. Your car's Bluetooth senses your phone's more than 15 feet away, pretty short range. It locks, you hear a little minor chirp, not a high-pitched, ridiculous chirp that Honda Civic's always had, but a nice, mellow, low-pitch, little blink of the lights and chirp, and the car's headlights turn off like I like. I don't want to wait a minute. I just wanted to get quiet quick when I walk away, being assured the car's locked up. Okay, you're done in Walgreens. You come back to your car. Same kind of deal. Within 15 feet of the car, the door is going to be unlocked because you have the app on your phone, and you're married to the car, and you just get in. And what do you do? You put your foot on the brake. You put the car in reverse and off you go. You got a nice big backup camera. That's different. You're not looking for ignition. You're not even swiping a, key, a hotel key fob like you might give your spouse or, or kids. Valet mode, you can limit the speed limit to 30. You could say the car won't go more than 30 as I hand this valet key over. All kinds of cool little things. So my article is going to try to capture that. What was fun for me is my wife and my parents hit me with questions I hadn't even thought of, right? Here I had a year and a half of pre-order to thought, think I thought of everything but also put in the back of my mind, not knowing if I'd ever get such a car in my lifetime. So you don't want to get too excited about it. But man, they hit me with questions I hadn't even thought of, and they were fun, including my uh, sister asking, you know, so what's the engine? As they got out of the front seats with her with their daughters and they come around the front. And of course I show off the frunk, front trunk, cute word. Everyone laughs at that. You open it and they see there's a lack of engine, pointing out it's all electrons. There's no fuel, there's no oil. I don't, you can throw all that crap. So. I spent Saturday before taking delivery of the car on a Sunday cleaning my garage of old crap that had to do with gasoline powered cars. Man, did that feel good to kind of get a fresh start for the next you know, decade plus of my life driving this thing. So that's my story, Jim. Uh, hopefully it, it didn't come across as, uh, it's, it's, to me, it's boastful because it's expensive. It's the most luxurious thing I bought in my entire life. Like I usually buy at or lower than the average American car price, right? This is a little higher because it's a long range. But it's fun to have a blog that a few humans have actually read in the first week. Mm -hmm. That is cool. That's where you feel like, you know, warts and all, any mistakes, everyone can learn from them together. Um, and and I, I appreciate it. I love the comments. The, the feedback's been great. Um, my, it's, not a, it's certainly not an automotive blog. I don't pretend it is at all. But dang, the tech, whether it's the Bluetooth, the backup camera, the quality of the camera, the self-driving trial I'm in, which I have for only 22 more days. I did not pay for that. I knew I could not fix the battery or the motor. So all wheel drive and long range, you have to buy up front. Self-driving, you can do later in this car. And it's $7,000 if you do it after the fact, or 5,500 when they do promotions occasionally and free trials, or 5,000 if you buy it with the car. We could not swing that, we didn't do it, we didn't want to finance it. So I skipped that, but it can be fixed at a later date. So I'll point out that, um, that it, the full self-driving we got to play, play with and try, lane changes and all that. Not perfect, but extremely impressive and smoother than humans and really good at falling lines. Even in heavy, heavy rain, obnoxious traffic, driving in New Haven, in rush hour, 40 mile an hour, stop and go traffic. You know what? It did a pretty good job in that with my hands on the wheel at all times and my foot hovering over the brake pedal in case something went wrong. Um, that's about it, Jim. It's been fantastic. Uh, it's a summary. There's a lot more stories uh, in the article for those who are interested. But it, the story is just unfolding, including finding rubber floor mats in New England, where you know immediately the black carpeting is going to get wrecked mm -hmm. with salt. Right? Mm -hmm. Those little things that are just like shopping for a case for your phone when it's brand new and mm -hmm. you're waiting a, a week for the case. That can be annoying. You know, when I drop it in the meanwhile, it's kind of like that with a shiny new car, and including parking in the garage and making sure you don't hit anything. This is a little bit wider and longer than my previous car and all that. All of that's been fun for me, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, congratulations, Paul. It's I don't think it's extravagant or or gaudy or any of those things. I, I actually I think it's for Tesla. It's very reasonable, and uh, you know you you've always been a very reasonable guy, and uh, and I think you took the the tech reasonable route, and and I I appreciate that. I, I you know I've will be moving our car. My Civic has two hundred and six thousand miles on it. Runs. As good today, by the way, as it did the sec the day I drove drove it off the lot. Sounds the same, 
starts the same, does the same with the exception of changing the batteries. That's the only thing I've changed on that car, you know, brakes and some other stuff. But yeah, yeah we're going to that... pass that car down to my daughter. And oh, the, cool. pl- the plan has been to replace it. And I, we, we went Subaru the last time we bought a new car. And I have really been impressed with my wife's Subaru. Nebraska, all wheel drive, in the snow, handles at the, it, it, it's amazing. That vehicle's got some amazing acceleration. I mean, there's some great stuff about her Outback. And she, we were talking about the other day, as soon as we pay that off, I'll pick up a new car. And so I've been thinking I'll get an Outback, but now after hearing this story, kind of like, hmm, maybe I need to, maybe I need to look into, because it is an affordable, Kevin threw the Jaguar version, you know, Jaguar's got one for 70. Yep, uh, there's more and more coming out, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Uh, Electric is a podcast where they talk about this stuff in the futures. There's more and more cars coming out. It's kind of like Richard Gunther, what he did for Internet of Things Home Automation was it five years ago, coming out with that excellent podcast as it was just taking off. That's happening with electric cars, right? Yeah. It'll be wonderful that there'll be a whole lot of competitors two and three years from now. Yeah. I love that. And this story, it goes back you know, to seeing an electric car in the Munich airport when I landed in 2014 in the airport, a gorgeous airport, like a mall and a shiny car just seeing the future like, wow. There's an impressive $80,000 car that's all electric. You know, you get your wheels turning, right? Wanting to lean towards that. Four-wheel drive is cool. It does lose a little bit of miles per gallon. But also for me, I'm often alone in the car. That's why I said I didn't need the size of the Tesla Model 3. It could have even been about the size of my um, Civic or even smaller, perhaps. I would have been okay with it. So for me, miles per gallon does matter because a lot of time it's a business trip where I'm going to be in the car for two, 250 mi- miles in that one day. And I just want to get home to go back to blogging and everything else after making my living right mm-hmm. and man this bluetooth for sound, phone calls fantastic just did a, a phone call tonight and i couldn't believe it it's like wow this sounds really good and they're hearing me perfectly all these little treats jim just they just keep hitting me every time i drive the car even 800 miles into the experience i keep finding something new um giant rear trunk like twice as big as what you and i have in the civic where you can't fold the seats down oh my goodness i put eight foot lumber from lowe's in my mm-hmm. tesla because it now fits with this, you know, I can do that again. It's nice to have a real trunk that with seats that fall down and a trunk below the trunk where the gas tank would be. Put your groceries in there, they ain't shifting at all. It's like a pouch. Awesome. <laughs> That's another fun part to show off to people asking and inquisitive what it's like to not have an engine. Well, you got the front trunk and then you have a special hidden trunk under the regular back trunk. Really cool. Um, I guess I'll do some 4K video at some point, going out in a sunny day when the weather's good and the car is clean. That hasn't happened yet. (laughs) It's winter, right? Um, But yeah, I'm going to have some fun with it. Well, I'll follow you for sure. Have you had any, there's this condition called, and I forget what they call it, but it's the fear of running out of battery. Like, because you, you know, you can't just pull off and get gas anywhere. You've got to kind of plan your battery stops. Have you struggled at all worrying about like just that, as soon as you pull out, you're starting to think about your next stop, your next hit, your next electrical hit for the car. No, the factory default was to show percentage of battery on the screen. But like my phone, I'm a nerd. I want to see something more useful. So I changed that to how many miles are you estimating are left? So my wife and everyone in the car can see here's the battery and it still shows the battery, how full it is, a little green indicator, but also shows how many miles of range left. So I don't treat that any different than a gas meter where I'm looking at how close I am to empty. I know the car can go up to 310 and I see where I'm at. But I did mess up one time. I was supposed to be driving my uh, other son back to Cambridge, Mass, and forgot I didn't have the electrician yet, so I didn't have the fast charging kit, and kind of messed up. You're supposed to, for extending the longevity of the car, you only want to charge like 80% battery. But before a long trip where you're going to Boston back in the middle of winter, where you're going to have the heat on and all kinds of stuff that makes it the worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, oops, I didn't give enough time to get it to fully charge. So I was like, oof, I'm at like 82%. I've got a... 100, a 210 mile trip and the car only has maybe 250. I'm cutting a little closer than I should. I got home with, you know, 30 something miles. My wife didn't freak out. I didn't forget about it. We have plenty of charging stations in that Connecticut, Northeast. We're in a population dense area. The charging network, the supercharging network is vast. There's three stations between here and Boston. I have no excuse to mess up and not go the 100 miles and somehow run out of electrons or fuel, right? I can stop and charge to 170 miles additional of capacity in half an hour at a supercharger. If you go to Panera Bread, it's not impressive. It's eight hours to get a full tank. So you're not gonna get that much out of parking and getting yourself a little juice when you're at Panera. Those regular chargers that Chevy Bolts and others use are not amazing. So a supercharger costs $70,000 per pump 
and it does DC voltage. It bypasses the charging electronics in the car that are handled in my house is, you know, meager a circuit does the charging. But soon with an electrician visit coming this Monday, I'll be getting to charging full overnight. So all that anxiety about range, it goes away. If I think I might be going to Boston or New York the next day, I always know from my employer that I'm going somewhere the next day. Okay. I just slide the slider on my phone and just tell it, please charge the car to full, 100%, because tomorrow's a big day. So no, I know what you're saying, range anxiety, but it's been a non-issue. And here, um, for those on camera, I'll just show there's my car. It's on Wi-Fi in my garage. There was a firmware waiting for me. Tesla gets me in and out of the dealership in an hour in Mount Kisco, New York. I drive home, did the firmware update. Uh, the next morning I wake up and it offered me the self-driving trial because it had the new firmware capable of that and it gave me 30 days to try it. So the phone app was, you know, minimal learning curve and easy to uh, understand. It's going to make sure I don't show my, you know, something I shouldn't on camera. Uh, no, this is fine. Here's where my car is at. It's half full, 144 miles left in West Hartford, Connecticut. 3.8 miles has seven of eight spots at the supercharger behind Red Robin. And there I tap on it and it's sent to my car the GPS direction. So when I get in my car right now, it'll drive me right. It'll just guide me to Red Robin. You can share Google Maps or Apple Maps. Click the share button, share it with your Tesla, and boom, you get in the car and off you drive using its on-screen nav display, which has been wonderful. So again, all these little things about a cloud-connected car that really sink in. Remember I said cloud-connected doorbell? Yeah. Well, this is a cloud-connected car. <laughs> you are buying into a community of 100,000 plus people driving Tesla 3s that have been lusting after such a car for maybe decades finally owning it, your risk is reduced because you're not at the point where there's only 30,000 in the world, right? Mm -hmm. It's a pretty good production run at this point. Um, I feel a little better, <laughs> you know, and the reviews just, they're amazing. P even though people bashed, maybe they had some problems with leasing or financing or some minor issues with door gaps, which I don't seem to have any, or alignments that Tesla might take a little long to fix, which they now fix in your driveway, by the way. They don't want you to go to a dealership. They want you to schedule a service. Whoops, there's my VIN. They want you to schedule service here um, and have someone come and fix it in your driveway with a van. They said 80% of service calls can be handled by someone coming to your house. I'm fine with that. I work from home some days of the week. Why wouldn't I want that, right? Mm -hmm. So again, uh, on and on goes the list of all these little things you might not have thought of that a, a cloud-connected car you lets you do. You push a button on the app and it'll, it'll drive itself over to the supercharger and uh and plug itself yep. in and charge itself up and then drive itself back and so jim uh, that's what they want to do fremont yeah. california where's my car is made right they want to have it delivered to your house forget dealerships and forget someone has to show you the ropes for an hour and sign financial paperwork i was in and out in an hour about 20 minutes of actual document signing most of it was online in advance so there's no surprises when you get to the dealer but it's tiny their lot only held like 12 cars they're ready for us to drive off the lot quickly in an hour that's way better though than a three hour four hour financing nightmare of what it used to be like negotiating price. Guess what? Everyone pays the same price in the Tesla too, by the way. So yeah, finally areas of improvement, Massachusetts and Connecticut. Wow. They don't know. They don't allow you to drive in an HOV lane. That's kind of lame, right? Oops. Yeah. Shouldn't they foster that? And then even worse, Connecticut just took away the $3,000 rebate two months ago. Ouch. That hurt. So yeah, I'm bashing the state. I live in a little bit. In a polite way, you know, it's all in my blog post saying we're a little backwards here. And then finally, license plates in Massachusetts, you got a lovely EV plate. Connecticut doesn't have such a thing. You know me. I've already emailed the DMV whining about it politely, <laughs> saying, you know, this is a little weird. Um, not in a nasty way, a constructive way, saying yeah. Massachusetts has had this for six years. They border our state. Anyway, we can do this <laughs> just politely. Right. No, um, it's, it's good. Nebraska doesn't yeah. either, by the way. We we struggle with that a little bit. Um, yep. And and we're not densely populated, so there is a little bit more distance in between those superchargers here. Um, and it's it's not as easy. I don't have a Red Robin that's, you know, three miles away. Uh, yep. so and if you had a Chevy, a Chevy Bolt would be tough because you've got to park for quite a while to charge at a lower charge yeah. rate. Yeah. And you have to find a charger that's compatible. Tesla's trying to double the superchargers again, I think this year, and they have a new technology that'll go even faster. So it, so yeah, there's all there's little things. The long range Tesla has a little feature where it can actually charge faster than the other Model 3s too. So the, there is some upsell going on. The 35,000, you're gonna miss some stuff like the sunroof that you can see from the rear seat. You end up with a traditional roof. It's got a roll bar, by the way. So it can handle four times its own weight if it's left on its roof, but with the battery pack down low, you're kind of unlikely to end up on your roof. And there's been a car that rolled over and they survived full highway speed. It flipped like five times 
and they lived. That's a big deal. Uh, the car is doing extremely well in impact resistance. And and it's kind of cool to get side curtain airbags, front airbags, and all that to one of my sons, right? He's going to now get a 2006 Civic that was rated pretty good in its time for safety. That's a win. We're both now safer. Um, that's good. <laughs> so if you're hearing nothing else in this podcast and safety is your thing, go read about it and watch the videos of Crumple Zone. When you look at that frunk, it's all about crumple, and there's no engine to push in and shove into your seat or into your knees. There's a motor down low that's unlikely to encroach on the cabin when you watch the crush videos. It's remarkable the perks that you have with a large flat battery, low center of gravity, and man, it, when you turn, the car doesn't lean like a normal car. It feels like you're on rails. There's barely any tilt. You just go around the turn. The tires don't squeal. It, it's unbelievable. The traction control, you don't feel any vibration or know that it's adjusting the speed instantaneously, like a thousand times a second. You just know if you jam the throttle even in full rain during a curve, which is stupid, nothing scary happens. Once you realize nothing scary has happened, because I had fears, like, am I going to drive this car like an idiot or feel nervous my first day from the dealership? It went away immediately. Once you realize the car does never does something stupid, including it won't let the rear get out on you or even in rain or whatever. Yet it has thrilling performance, even in those adverse conditions. Mm -hmm. So you don't feel mm -hmm. it's, there's no setting, there's no tuning, there's no sport mode. It's just by default, an unbelievable experience yeah. driving yeah. the car. It's just, wow. sounds good. All right. Sounds I've gushed good. enough. <laughs> yeah, well, you've, you've you've almost sold me on one. Uh, I I may look into it a little bit just to just to kind of see. Again, Nebraska, there's some there's some real disadvantages here in Nebraska, but um, ah, maybe I'll have a maybe it's one of those things I don't look for. I'm sure if I started looking at them and then I started looking around, I would see more and more of them. I don't today. I would say I don't I don't know if I've ever seen one here in the city of Omaha. I'm sure there are. I just don't, uh, I'm just not looking for them. So maybe, Tesla, maybe I'll see more now that I'm looking for them. Yeah, Tesla.com has a supercharger finder, but if you're just looking for, oh, what is the company called? Plug something. Uh, there's an app and a website, PlugShare, that'll show you all kinds of chargers, including those behind, tucked behind a Panera Bread and others. And with some adapters in your trunk, your Tesla can charge off of that too, so you get the best of both. I imagine you'll have many more pumps, or sorry, uh, superchargers near you in, uh, Nebraska, another challenge, though, is the $35,000 car might not come out in time. It's supposed to be four more months, but the, all the rebates, the $7,500 got halved January 1st. It gets disappears for every Tesla buyer of a Model 3 starting in July 1st. The $35,000 car probably won't come out in time, or even if it does, I think there's still tens of thousands, maybe even 100,000 plus people still on back order right. who got their initial back order in a year and a half ago. So when you have friends and family interested in the car that, you know, like a Tesla Model 3, yeah, I don't know how any uh, they can really get a Model 3 yeah. anytime soon if they're waiting for the, no, the $35,000 one then. to come out. I'm back to the Subaru. Well, I mean, the price does jump. There's 40000 and 50000 They have different yeah. options, including a performance one. Mine's four and a half seconds. They have one that's a ridiculous 3.2. It's unbelievable. Basically, uses thicker gauge cabling to the motor. It's otherwise the same car. It's, it's insane. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's all good. Um, I've never been as excited about a new car um, at all. And it hasn't dampened at all after 10 days. That's a pretty good sign. My Honda Civic was there. I was pretty happy with it. And it didn't really go away over the 13 years, you know. Um, so far, this this looks to be good, too. Would you drive right. it across uh, the country? Sure. Oh, my God. I'm already thinking, like, I'm comfortable. Uh, the seats are great. I have no discomfort after long trips there and back. Um, so if, so if, we yeah, do having up, an adventure. if we do a meetup in Omaha, you drive it out here? Mm. <laughs> Doing that alone wouldn't be as fun with someone, but maybe I yeah, convince maybe we could some people, from work. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we get uh, we get a few people to pick you. You know, you pick up along the way and uh, make it kind of interesting. I am a, a risk reduction business person, right? When I think about mm -hmm. data loss at work, it's about risk. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I tend to drive maybe six, seven, eight hours away. A long trip like that, I, I got to do some hotel stops, right? I wouldn't be putting myself into a twelve. I'm not. No, I'm a not a twenty year old driving a Florida straight yeah, line. I used to, right? As a it's, a, year old. it's a long drive. So. I, so yeah, I might be pushing it. Um, and basically I think about things like if the flight is 150 bucks round trip to Nebraska and you I had to take fly. one less day off from work, I'd probably fly, right? You but would fly. Yeah, I would love to long. have a meetup, yeah. It's too long. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get that figured out. But it, more, more than that, you know, I've done a bunch of trips <clears throat> in the Civic. I think the farthest I've gone, mm, I think 12 hours is about the farthest I'll go. You know, I've, I flew out to, or I drove out to the caves. Uh, a few times I brought the Honda out there and then I started flying. I was like, Oh, 10 hours over the weekend, over a long weekend. 
10 or 12, it was that drive. And it just got to, it got on me, you know, mm -hmm. and it was a great car. It did great. I got, you know, 35, 40 miles to the gallon on the trip. It was, it was a good car to travel in. I was never sore. Uh, but I just got to the point. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to fly. It's a lot easier. So yeah. it, but you know, that is something to consider if you need to drive, you know, Hey, what if I have to drive to New York from Omaha? Is that a car I can jump in and realistically make that trip? Uh, if I have to. So Jim, that not only does Tesla makes finding superchargers easy, the nav system has, you know, a map. Fine. You tap the screen and up to the right, it shows like a, a globe. You touch the globe and now it turns into a sky view, an aerial photography based view. It's like, oh, okay. What's the other little icon next to it? A little lightning bolt. You tap that, it shows all the superchargers near you. You tap on the supercharger, and now your directions are instantly rerouted to that supercharger. But it even tells you how many spots are available. You're not going to get off the exit if there's no spots to charge. And so far they've looked 80% empty at all the ones near me. So even on the holidays, right around Christmas, when everyone's traveling, I saw no issues with finding a charger spot on any of my 800 miles so far. So I've been good, mostly charging at home, but that, you know, but occasionally on, uh, at the supercharger. Um, so yeah, more to come. Uh, Jim, I have one last thing that has more to do with tech and home lab. And I, I something I, it's off camera I wanna show you before we yeah, wrap, is that okay? Let's do it. Let's do all it. right, so back to home lab stuff. We talked a little bit about storage and risk reduction and, and you're like Mr. Drobo, right? So with 10 gig networking, new things are possible for storage. So let me show you a temporary loan I have from a rather familiar brand that your audience is used to. And for audio listeners, I'll explain what I'm showing here. There we go. That's a familiar logo. Oh yeah. Synology, Synology. DS 1618. That's a 2018 model plus better horsepower, better CPU. Finally, what's in it? 10 gig, Jim. So I've had 10 gig in my home for years with the ZND arriving, right? But what's special about what you can do with these motherboards with 10 gig and these thin monoprice cables um, is astounding transfers between servers like a vSAN needs. So when you have NVMe drives, you can actually pump enough data over the PCI bus, over the 10 gig to have the one gig network really holding you back. So here I've got a Synology where I can actually do a bit of testing. And as you heard from Dave McCabe, it's not simple to benchmark. I'm not really a benchmark site, right? Doing it properly, scientifically, very difficult. What I'll be doing is things like, hey, here's how you iSCSI attach it to vSphere 6.7 update one. That's kind of my bag, right? Um, how do you use this in a practical way in a home lab and show off that it has 10 gig performance of that? And by doing caching through an add-on, um, yes, you can add a layer of SSD cache to this NAS. Would I keep or invest in such a thing? Eh, not so sure, because again, I've got 10 gig drives for daily backups, and I've got lots of NVMe drives around that I can um, use. And vMotion, uh, VMs you can move from one NVMe to another, like seamlessly while the VM's running. It's not such a big deal if you have a bunch of discrete drives anymore. There's many options for moving things around and dealing with the relatively small size of SSDs. So exciting times ahead, uh, more articles to come about this kind of stuff, but just thought I'd give uh, the audience a little bit of preview while I had you here. I, I've enjoyed interviewing you from this location here tonight. Like you've had so many options available to you to grab the camera, show some things. You got stuff on your desk. You got your PC right there. I really thought it was going to be hard because, you know, you want to look at, you want to look at the can or you want to look at the video that's on the screen to your, to your left, as opposed to look at the camera and you've done a nice job. You don't have a video underneath that camera there. Do you? <laughs> no, you got me thinking though. You've got an iPhone 4, right? What if I joined the Google Hangout and stuck this yeah. by the webcam so I could see your face while I'm talking? Yeah. That would have made a lot of sense. That's the hardest part, but, right? But, Jim, you know what happened? Right before this call, I'm on my phone talking to my son about DMV and how we're going to deal with the Pittsburgh trip next week where we're driving the car to him, and we have to sell the car at Pennsylvania DMV, and hopefully I fly home with the uh, Connecticut plates and he gets the Pennsylvania plates. To coordinate all that, it just had to happen because he's going to CES next week, so that's mm -hmm. cool. So all of a sudden we realized, oh, we have to do this like now, tonight, and, and deal with all the logistics. So family first, I wasn't quite ready for this phone. I would have had a camera. I would have had a little better. I would have had a better headset too. Oh, no, so I got to rethink the microphone. Good. Those, are, those are pretty good. Those are pretty good bows. They sounded pretty good. They're not bad. Yeah, it's still Bluetooth, right, to the laptop. Not ideal. I thought we well, might move around the whole thing. Nah, nah, uh, I should use a lapel mic next time or my boom mic, which I don't know if I'm going to set up here. I think I'll still – the boom mic still. is in use quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, a boom would be nice, but I, I don't think it's been bad. Either way, because most of the time I'm working on the workbench, not podcasting. Right. Here. Yeah. But thanks for doing this. Uh, and, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, it's uh, always good to catch up with you. 
I've, I have really liked that setup. I I think maybe I'll I'll consider it in the new place. Uh, Uyghur's got a pretty nice setup too. But uh, so what are you what are you showing there? So the Falcon Heavy, the most powerful rocket to launch since Saturn, was back in February, and I got to witness that with one of my sons in Florida. So I got to see this with my own eyeballs with him and see the boosters come back down on their tail and land seven minutes later. That was awesome, Jim. Was Having seen the cool. shuttle as a kid and getting to share that with my kids. Yeah. That was a really cool trip. So having this in my wallet to just kind of remind me of that fun experience. Yeah. It's cool. And yeah, I'm just reminding people, you can print pictures, by the way. And cameras are getting better and better in phones. This can is you, my own photo. I wasn't that close. I was seven miles away. So Can you imagine but, if NASA on the space shuttle would have been able to bring those boosters back and land them instead of dropping them in the water? Yeah. And, no, seeing it firsthand, it was like, yep. Yeah. This, this It was really cool. Yeah. Um, and seeing, hearing the crowd reaction, right? The rumble and all that, but just being with humans, it's kind of like the movie theater experience versus, you know, alone at home. It's not the same. It's good to get out and do stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. The cheering, the cheering and stuff. Well, Paul, thanks again for uh, we we won't do for those listening live or to the recorded show. No, no post show crypto this week. I'm not going to. We won't do that without Uyghur. and not a lot to update. Uh, but no post show crypto. Paul, hang tight for just one second. Let me wrap this up. But thanks for doing what you do. I always look forward to these shows back in the fall. I was starting to schedule things and I was like, Hey Paul, it's time to have you back on. And this, we, we actually delayed this for other reasons. And I'm kind of glad we did. We hit you at a super sweet spot. <laughs> like it couldn't have been any, any better time. I mean, there was just so much great stuff to talk about. So, so thanks for saying yes. And thanks for letting me move it into January and, uh, and thanks for making some time available for me tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I, the timing did work out well. I had some health stuff going on in October. This worked out great. The, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm always grateful to be here, and it's and it's great to be uh, uh, feeling better and here with you tonight. So Good. thank you. Well, hang tight. Don't go anywhere. Just one second. I will remind folks if um, for the last couple of months we've been I've been gathering everybody into the Fitbit group, and then I do a crazy thing and buy the Apple Watch. So I'll be passing hey. I'll be passing my Fitbit down to Sarah. She said she'd take it, and I'm going to figure out how to get. Uh, converted over to the Fitbit network as well. So I've got some work to do on that as well. But uh, if you, there are others out there and there's a Home Gadget Geeks group in Fitbit and I still have the app on my phone. So if you're interested in doing that, send me an email, jim at theaverageguy.tv. I think you can find that group if you just search in the group sections. It's under Home Gadget Geeks. Don't forget, you can financially support the show if you want to do that. We always appreciate those because I don't do a ton of blogging. I don't have a lot of that kind of revenue, but certainly from a podcasting standpoint, uh, it's available out there. We have plans as little as a buck a month. Who can't do a buck a month? If you want to support the show, and you don't have to, but if you want to, head out to theaverageguy.tv slash Patreon, and uh, that will get you to the group. You just kind of see what's out there. I do post the crypto shows out there. If you want to go back and <clears throat> have a look at those, you can do that as well. If you have any questions or you want to, you have any comments, you want to send me something nice, many of you want to do that. Each week, I enjoy getting the emails from you. I do. I can't always write back long answers to them. But when I do, I appreciate that. Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv gets that me there as well. If you want to do that via Twitter, you can do it at Jay Collison. Or if you want to join us on our Facebook group, you can join us Facebook.com slash group slash TheAverageGuy. Don't forget that the TheAverageGuy.tv platform, both web and media hosting, powered by Maple Grove Partners. Yep, Christian's still around. We've had a hard time. He's been really busy at Amazon. But he is, Maple Grove Partners, is providing secure, reliable, high-speed hosting from people that you know and you trust. Everything we do here at the Average Guy Network is hosted, media, web, everything we do. If you download the MP3, it's everything is there at Maple Grove Partners. If you're interested, they have plans. They'll customize stuff for you as little as $10 a month. Great, a great way to do it, a great way to get involved. Uh, visit maplegrovepartners.com. And then don't forget to get that app homegadgetgeeks.com gets you there as well. And both Android and iPhone is available for you. Maybe you got a new phone over Christmas and it's time to load that app on there. Just load it on there so you have it. And uh, homegadgetgeeks.com, you can get it there as well. One new site we're working on, and it's not fully done yet, but if uh, maybe by the time you're listening to this, we've got more stuff out there. Go to theaverageguy.tv slash swag, S-W-A-G, swag. We're going to have some long sleeve shirts. We've got some hoodies coming. I think we're going to have some, uh, we may have some uh, coffee mugs. I don't know. Whatever we can think of would be available out there. I don't want you to have to buy too many things. But if you want to go to the store. 
Yeah, go ahead. Any hello, any hello fresh icons showing up? <laughs> <You've> been... <laughs> I haven't got I mean, the hello fresh part yet. I know, but I'm waiting for that icon to show up in your uh, in your homepage or something. It's... My wife and I have been enjoying that, that too, by the way. So you and I, I have that in common it? as well. Yeah. Oh, nice. K- K- kids are away now, and it's suddenly like, oh, something we could do together and enjoy. Oh, it's yeah. super So I, I, I listen to you gush about it. It's like, yep, similar experience yeah. in this household. It's been good. There's a Where's link the- in every, actually, there's a link. I kept it kind of low profile. There's a save $40 on your first box link in every single post that we do. If you just search for that, it's right in the cool. show section. So if anybody wants to take advantage of it, that's really the easiest way um, to get it done. But Paul, yeah, it has been like, and we've been lately, we've been doing meals, like bigger versions of their meals where we've just bought the stuff and then made the meal. So they kind of, it's nothing we would have ever done before. Some of the meals are things We've tried things like apple carrot slaw that we never would have done. Yep. We never would have come up with that. We never would have done that. But but what have you like what what have you gotten so far that was either a surprise or that you really liked? Mm. We tried it for about two months. We're actually trying different vendors to make sure we stay with HelloFresh, but we were on it for about two months. And uh, I don't know, 80%, 85% of the time, my wife and I both enjoy what we're eating, like like enough that we would do it again. Yeah. That's a good sign. That's a pretty high hit rate because I don't know how to cook. So if I were making it myself, yeah, I wouldn't be anywhere near that kind of hit rate for likability. <laughs> uh, it's the planning, right? Like it's still yeah. taking 90 minutes or something. You still get to, you know, warm up the oven and mm-hmm. prep the food and wash mm-hmm. it and cook it and then eat it and then put away all the dishes. That's probably an 80, 90 minutes. That's a good chunk of our evening. Yeah. It takes but out a blog, but it's, well, it's quality but it's time the, and the food is good. I yeah, mean, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I found it different. Like instead of just like, I would come home and Sarah would have a casserole or something that we'd, we'd always eat. And I would just load it on a plate and I'd come down here and I would just, I'd wolf it down while I was working where mm. it's changed things for me is, and then I come home and I'm, she's in, she's starting and I'm like, okay, where can I help you? And so she'll say, Hey, I need you to chop this. Or can you cook the meat? Or can you do this kind of thing? And we do it together. And, and then we sit down and sometimes she'll have me pick up a bottle of wine on the way home or, you know, something different that we just wouldn't normally do. And then, um, we've actually found ourselves sitting at the table, talking to each other. Like, imagine that, like (laughs) after five kids and raising kids for 30 years, you know, you start thinking maybe that's never going to happen again. And it's actually super enjoyable. And we sit at the table and talk and, enjoy a little dessert, maybe a little wine or finish off the beer or whatever it is. It's just changed that for us. And it's not because it's three meals a week. It's not every single day. I don't know if we could sustain every single day, but we plan it, you know, okay, this week we're going to do Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And then we have that kind of planned out. And, uh, and we have our box delivered Saturdays. The FedEx guy is really good. You were talking earlier. Our FedEx guy is really good about covering that box when it gets here. So we, we actually put a little plastic bag that we tie to the, to the, to the, to the rail and, or sometimes they have it and HelloFresh gets covered. So, um, that, that's God, it's just been a great experience. So I can't, it's I've, I, the most questions I've gotten is from families. Like we have picky eaters. Yeah. There's different, there's different, there's different flavors in some of these meals and, uh, in, in your, Hot dogs and corn dogs and hamburger kids uh, and chicken nuggets. Um, it's different, but I'd encourage you to just give it a try. It's been super good for me. And like you said, Paul, I don't. You've been trying. So you tried HelloFresh, your Blue Apron, probably. What's the other one? Do, is there another one you do you remember? What? Um, and I forget that chef. Something chef. That's the one. That's how yeah. also. Yeah, okay. there's a bunch of them. So I just want to know the differences before yeah. I settle and yeah, stick no, with no, one no. for years. Right. So I don't know yet, but we'll, okay. you know, we'll see how it goes. Well, um, check, the, check the post out. If you're listening to this and you still haven't done it yet and you want to do it, check the post out. I've been putting that $40 off link that's out there. If you Excellent. actually contact me, if you send me an email, Jim at the average guy TV, I, I, they give me some f- like free weeks that I can just give away. So let me know the $40 deal. I make a little bit off of the, so if you want to just, if you want to support the show that way, you can do it that way. Or if you want to get the better deals, and I've got some, they, they give me a limited number of coupon codes I can send to you as well that give you almost a free week. So let me know, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv. Paul, I appreciate you saying that. Mike patiently waits at the end of the show for the HelloFresh. <laughs> well, I, I didn't want to let him down. He, he ribs you every time. So, I mean, how can we have an episode without it? He does. No, I appreciate you mentioning that. We are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at TheAverageGuy.tv. 
slash live. Love to have you join us live some week, uh, maybe in the new year, maybe in 2019. This is a year you come out and join us live. Appreciate the folks that stayed around tonight in the new year, Kevin and Joe and other Jim, Ken uh, out there. I appreciate you guys staying around late again. No crypto in the post, but uh, but thanks for coming out tonight. We'll be back next week. Rieger and I are going to catch up on things like the Apple Watch and the Xbox and some other tech stuff that we got going on. We'll, uh, we'll catch up on that as well. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.